I'd like to introduce you to lecture 10, which is still uh, chapter 7 on the skeleton. And we're going to finish up the skeletal system by looking at what you need to know about the appendicular skeleton. So something important to remember again is that the appendicular skeleton is going to be composed of the shoulder girdle, the scapula, which is only attached by one tiny joint between the clavicle and the manubrium of the sternum. We then have your upper appendages, the proximal and distal region, and then we have your lower appendage. And remember that the pelvic girdle, excluding the sacrum, is part of this whole uh, attachment point. This is highly, heavily attached. This is what's kind of neat when we look at our um, appendicular skeleton, that the um, lower appendic appendicular skeleton is very heavily attached and probably because that's our weight bearing area and where a lot of animals put a lot of their weight and strength into walking. So to begin with the appendicular skeleton, what we're looking at here again is the bones of the limbs and their girdles. And girdles just means to wrap around because it, it wraps around the axial skeleton. So we have what's called the pectoral or shoulder girdle and the pelvic girdle. So to begin with, with the pectoral girdle, this includes the scapel, the clavicles and scapulae. And these are kind of like related bones because some, some books said clavicles were um, long bones. That's not true. They develop as intramembranous bones. That means as tissues that help to form that girdle. And this includes the scapulae and the clavicles. And as we look at these bones, you're going to have to know various features of these as listed on your bone sheet. So what the pectoral girdle does is it attaches the upper limbs either loosely, you know, loosely or tightly to the axial skeleton. In us, it's a very loose connection. So let's look at a, at a close up of the um, pectoral girdle. So there's your scapula. And right here is what you call your coracoid process, which means the crow, it looks like a crow's head. Your chromium area. Remember, on our body regions, the acromion is right there. It's a very important landmark for the clavicle comes together with the uh, pectoral girdle. Okay, and then the pectoral girdle is held in place by the clavicle attaching to the manubrium. Okay, and then you're going to learn about your little what's called glenoid fossa here, which then attaches the pectoral girdle to the humerus there, which is going to make your upper appendage. So here's a clavicle in general. Again, it's a flat bone, uh, which means it develops by intra, uh, intramembranous development. And what you mainly need to do is recognize it and also know the end, the medial part, which connects to the sternum, basically the manubrium, and also the lateral part, which attaches to the acromium. Okay. So let us look at the scapula, and please pay attention to this, because you will be tested on this. This is the anterior view of the, the um, scapula. That means this is the part of the scapula that's kind of hidden behind the ribs. When you stare at a skeleton and looking through the ribs, this is what you see, the anterior aspect. And, and, and you're going to have to know whether this is left or right. So this is your medial edge. This is your lateral edge. That means this is where it will attach to the humerus and that's going to be your little glenoid cavity right there where the head of the humerus fits in there so know that that's your lateral border your medial border this is facing forward so this so you have to determine whether this is left or right and in this case this is your right if you look at the orientation of this that's going to be one of the harder things you do on a test and one thing you can just do is think about again where what are these borders Okay, because this is a big area for muscle attachment that you find along the back. And look at all that muscle attachment area. That's medial. It's medial. And there's your lateral. Now, you need to pay attention to the coracoid process and, of course, the acromium, because these are major attachments points to the clavicle and also to the muscles that help us to lift the arm and, and move the scapula to lift, to lift the shoulder. So pay attention to these borders. Let's look at the posterior view. Now you can see the spine. That's a very big spine. We talked about, you know, some people might want to call it a crest. 
but it, it classifies as a spine. In this case, we have these two little fossa right here, the superior and inferior, and I'm not going to make it me memorize those, but these are major muscle attachment areas in the back from moving the shoulder, a lot of strength in here. And now let us look at a lateral view. This again is where the head of the humerus fits in. There's your nice acromium and your coracoid process. Again, it looks, it's called the, the crow process because it looks like the head of a crow. And look how nice the blade of the scapula shows on this one. Nice flat bone, again. So now let's look at the actual limbs themselves. So what we call the arm, we're going to call the humerus, at least the bone within it. The forearm is to be made of two parallel bones called the radius and the ulna. And then the hand is going to be the most complex part of this, being made up of what we call carpals, which is another term for wrist. If you ever hear of carpal tunnel syndrome, that means that group of bones, the tendons and ligaments and, and uh, um, bursa around that, the synovial joint that covers all eight of those bones is having some issues. We have the metacarpals, which just means beyond the carpals, and then the phalanges, which is another term for digits or fingers, and phalanges also can mean toes, that's the problem. So it just means these little bones we find in hands and toes, because in most animals, they're about the same, and us, we treat fingers and toes differently. So let us look at the humerus, and I know there's a lot of jokes about this, but they're not funny, haha. -ha. Okay, uh, uh, the humerus, be able to recognize the head, be able to recognize left and right, that means you have to know the anterior, posterior. Notice on the anterior, there's this little notch that comes out there. It's a little notch, okay, like a protuberance that comes out there. I'm going to see that helps to steady the, the forearm bones in a minute. But look at the head of the humerus. Guys, don't confuse this with the femur. You're going to see later the femur is going to have a head that looks like this in the lower appendage and have these large trochanters. So that's going to be more of the femur. Okay, because those two bones, bones are regularly confused. So on the humerus, pay attention to the head, has a very narrow neck, and then it has these things called turbicles, which I'm probably not going to ask you. But do know that muscles attach there. Know that this goes into the glenoid fossa of the scapula. And again, you should be able to tell that this is the lateral, the medial side. That means this faces the inside of the body. That orientation is you're able to tell this is left or right. And obviously in this skeleton, it's the right. So when you look, so when I ask you, is this left or right? Think about the skeleton facing you. And know this medial side in anatomical position. Know the lateral side. Look at where that attachment point is and say, oh yeah, this is left or right. Okay, some other things to pay attention to on this. Again, it's going to be this region right here, which is going to form the elbow. We'll see when we look at the, so let's look at here at both anterior and posterior views. So um, uh, this is the view we're looking at. Now, what's very typical of the humerus is this is a very important fossa. And these things called epicondyles are important here. Because again, these help to form your uh, elbow joint. And when we look uh, particularly here, that little notch is going to, we're going to see this little area is going to be a very important hinge joint that forms with the um, ulna bone. So this notch is very important, very indicative of the humerus. But know the anterior perspective, posterior perspective, this is the giveaway. And look at the direction of the head too in relation to that because that tells you whether this is a left or a right. And in class, you should look at both left and right on the intact skeletons and get an idea, okay, of, of um, how to identify them. So now let's look at the forearm. There's your radius and ulna, and notice the, conne notice the connective tissue that braces them in place and also a little connective tissue down here that holds them in place. And the way the radius and ulna work is the um, ulna is your fixed bone. That means it is kind of like the attachment point where the radius we're going to see is the rotating point. And when we look also at the ulna, this is 
where we form the elbow joint, this is what articulates with the humerus. There's a direct articulation between the humerus and the owner in this little hinge joint. And look at this intact on the skeleton and alone. And the owner is always going to be a little longer than the radius. Now, another thing that the owner does is it articulates, obviously, with the radius and the term radius. This bone right here means that it radiates the hand. That means that this thing moves in a circle, a radian, and rocks around to twist the hand. Your hand is mostly attached to the radius. 90% of your carpals are attached to the radius. The um, owner is not involved so much in hand movement. Look, it's not even directly there. Okay, and we'll see this a little when we look at the carpals. So know the radius and the owner and look at the important landmarks on them. Pay attention to what's called the olecranon area, because this is what forms the elbow, and you'll recognize that forms the elbow, the olecranon area. And we often pay attention to this little area called the styloid processes at the base, because what these are major palpation points to see where that gap is, where the wrist ends and these bones begin, the forearm begins. This is an important site for looking for nerves and for looking for tendons and any particular damage that occurs in those areas. This is a close-up of the elbow joint. So we see the radius, that small little pivot point that allows again the arm to rock, the hand to rotate. There's part of the owner, the rest of it is behind in that notch, and there's the hinge joint right there, so the owner moves up and down, it flexes and extends along that, this is the elbow from the back, your olecranon process, locked in that fossa, there's the rest of the head of the owner, and again, what this does is it allows it to flex and expand and not hyperextend, that's a lockout point. And that's kind of funny because many animals could, could double joint, but we don't want that to double joint because we don't want to pick some up and all of a sudden our elbows bend backwards. So that's a lockout point. And you have an, a, a nerve here that passes along a radial nerve that's sometimes called the funny bone. It's a very superficial nerve, real close to the surface. And sometimes hitting that bangs that nerve against the bone and it creates quite a, quite a little tingling and shock for a while and quite a lot of pain. So now here's your distal portion of the upper appendage, okay, which is distal to the forearm bones. And what you need to know on the wrist is just generally know the carpals in general. I think it is important to know uh, that um, what's called the scaphoid and, and is the major carpal that holds the wrist in place, so most of your attachment is going to be between, be between the um, scaphoid and this one called the lunate, and there's a neat little one that we can see in a minute. Okay, um, I'll highlight. So mostly know that these are the carpals. That is your actual wrist, and that is covered by a synovial sac and filled with fluid, and each bone itself is covered with a halogen articular cartilage. Now, one thing about the hand is the pisiform. Okay, so this is important. In the anatomical position, here's your medial, your thumbs, your lateral. On the medial side of your wrist, that means the bottom of your wrist, right below your pinky, as far as you can go, you could stick your thumb on the palm of your hand and rub and feel that little piece of form. It hangs out there right on the medial region. That's a very important attachment point. And guys, sometimes in here, also, what can happen is here and in your webs, you can actually find sesamoid bones, little bones that, that help support when people use these appendages a lot. What else do you need to know on the hands? The metacarpals. And we name them one, two, three, four, five. We count from lateral to medial. That means outside to inside. And I'm not going to ask you which is which, except the first is a little distinguished from to, uh, two to five based on its stubbiness and its broad shape. The phalanges, okay, there's three, actually 
for four of your fingers, there's three sets of phalanges, and then for the thumb, there's two. And don't worry about that. That's called a Hox modification, and that's what allows us to have an opposable thumb that can do a lot of stuff. Actually, some people are born with what's called spider fingers, and they have an extra phalange, and it makes and the thumb actually looks like an extra finger. It looks like you have five fingers, not just four fingers and a thumb. And the condition does affect how a person can grip stuff and drive and get around in general. So for the phalanges, which I'm not going to ask you number, you know, one through five again, but I do expect you to know on the hand, not separate, because that's kind of mean, is this is uh, going to be your proximal, medial, distal, because remember, these are actually your metacarpals. It's all part of the pad of the hand. So that means the, the, the pad of your hand start ends here and this is where you actually start seeing your fingers so these make up the actual fingers so you have your proximal because it's closest to the axial skeleton medial distal and the distals always have a pad now we're finishing up with the lower appendage okay and now we're going to look at your hip bone this is be the more complex of the structures and we're going to see that the hip bones are a major they form the coxa bone, okay, or sometimes called the os coxy, okay, and that again just means hip bone in other languages, Latin and Greek. And what they do is attach the axial skeleton to the lower. Now, people, what's important about the pelvic girdle? This is not this is axial, not appendicular, even though they work together. And that joint there is an incredible brace that holds this in place and also spreads out the weight bearing uh, uh, um, function. So this is why particularly when uh, women in general develop osteoporosis, this is a very thin bone and some of the weight of the body will be spread out to there and this can actually crack these bones too. So this is all weight bearing right here. Well, we have, a, or we have to be able to identify three bones in the pelvic girdle. One is going to be right around here called your ilium, and that just means basically the pelvic. And know the iliac crest. This is a palpation point. That means a feeling point where we can tell where the pelvic girdle is and then, in effect, where the, uh, um, the uh, pelvic cavity is because the pelvic cavity fills this area and particularly right into there, into that little notch area. So then we're going to have the ischium which is going to be right about there. And we'll see from the side how to recognize that. And this is what you sit on, the weight bone, sit bones, whatever you want to call it. And then we have the pubic bones right here. And again, without color, it's hard to see. And, and generally on the skull, I mean, on the real uh, uh, body, you can see the suture lines. Because again, these are all parts that fuse together. And these tend to be both flat and irregular bone combinations. So let's look at this better from the side and see what we need to know. So here's the three bones from the side, the ilium. And now you can see where that goes. There's your crest. Ala just means the wing because it looks like a little butterfly wing. Okay, there's your pubic bone, pubis bones, however you want to say it. And then there's the ischium, what you sit on. So say, I sit on my ischium. Okay, right there, they take the weight of the body when you're sitting. And this articulation here with the lower leg, I mean, with the uh, lower appendage, uh, attaches to the femur, we'll see it's called the acetabulum. Know that, that means cup of vinegar. Because in the old, old days, the, um, when the Romans and Greeks and Italians were looking at anatomy, they used to drink honey and vinegar a lot because they thought these were very protective to the body. We still do that today, actually. And this looked like the little cups that vinegar came in or what was called back then acetic acid, not vinegar. And that's where the acetabulum comes from. So know these three bones, be able to recognize them with, the, um, um, with this on the skeleton and, and off the skeleton. And I'm not going to ask you too many features. Again, the main features are going to be knowing the bones plus the iliac crest, acetabulum. You need to know the obturator for Raymond. This is an area where a lot of muscles, nerves, and other junk goes through. Okay, so that's a very important point. Again, so um, 
and you should uh, and I'm not going to make you know the ischial spine which is also is a very important point and the ischial tuberosity because again this is a very important attachment point plus a weight bearing point this is looking at the separated pelvic girdle and something uh, um, we're going to see here is where the pubic bones come together um, we're going to call that the uh, pu uh, pubic symphysis. There we go, the pubic symphysis or pubis symphysis. That just means this is, a, again, a joint. That's a joint that allows slight rocking and compression. So the hips are flexible. And some animals like rodents, they could totally flex that joint to the point where they can almost dislocate their hips and literally wrap the hips almost to the, to the pubic bones or um, literally opposite each other i mean literally uh, uh, facing each other okay and allows them to squeeze into tight places in us it's a little more stable but again look at the three bones and this is the attachment point for where the um ilium attaches to the sacrum so when we look at the pelvis you're going to have to be able to tell the difference between male and female pelvis. And don't go by size because that varies from person to person. I'm sure there's a lot of females that have pelvises bigger than me. So whatever. In some animals, the female pelvis is bigger and some the male pelvis. It all depends. In us, it depends on body size more than anything else. What we're going to look at are differences in shapes. And this would be more helpful in lab to look at this. And don't go measuring angles. We're going to see that the bone thickness of the female pelvis is a little lighter, the men a little heavier, the acetabulum tends to be smaller, and the man is larger. And this has to do with the angle of attachment and also the ratio of bone, uh, leg bones. Don't worry about that. To the rest of the body, we're going to see that the sacrum in the female is going to be a little wider, the man is going to be narrower, and we're going to see that the coccyx is going to be straighter down in the female and less movable and more twisted in the the male. I'm going to show you some other stuff too, particularly what we call the um, sacral curvature and the, and the pubic curvature. So when we look at male and female, the pelvic girdle from the front perspective, here's the main thing. Look at the male. It tends to be more taller and less flared out. Females, the ilium are more flared out. And this is only after puberty, you see this, literally maybe even a year or two after puberty, it's more pronounced. In young children, we can't tell the difference at all. And that's a big problem with telling the gender in children. We either have to hope that there's hormone levels left in the skeleton, some hormones, or we look at other features like uh, ratios of other bones and or particularly looking at the hyoid or skull features. But usually before puberty, it's very hard to tell. Everybody looks kind of like a little mixture of a boy and a girl as far as the bone ratios go and, and the shapes of the pelvis. Um, in the male, this pubic arch right here is narrow. In females, it's broad. And I will show you this, you know, in class. This is something for you to know. And the other thing, too, is the pelvic basket. In the man, if you have a large hand, you can't shove your hand down that basket. It gets stuck on what's called the ischial tuberosities. If you look down, you will see these two bumps. In the female, if you put your fist down there, it can go right through almost like a baby coming out of the basket. And this is purposeful. This is a catch basket and a development region for the baby. This is more just for upright stands. Now, let's look at the lower limb to finish this off. So now we're gonna first look at the upper leg, the thigh or the femur, and the lower leg, the tibia and the fibula. Notice, upper arm, humerus. Very similar bone. Lower leg, we have tibia and fibula. In the arm, it's radius and ulna. Very similar purposes. As a matter of fact, the, um, uh, um, we'll see that these are almost corollaries. And then instead of carpals, we have tarsals. Okay, we do have metatarsals instead of metacarpals like the hand. And then we have phalanges, very much like the phalanges of the hand. So let's look at the upper leg, where the major bone is the femur. What you need to know about the femur is the head, very prominent head, very prominent neck. These you have to know. These are called palpation location points, the greater and the lesser trochanter. Notice that difference from the, the humerus. 
these are major attachment points and guys and there's a capsule that fits over here it's in a dense irregular connective tissue that fits over here to form that hip joint that large huge synovial joint which just covers that whole area um, of course you have to know the lateral side the medial side the medial obviously has the bone face again to attach to the um, acetabulum so know that that articulates the acetabulum okay on your anterior view you don't see much down here but on the posterior view you see a little notch which is very similar to what we see on the, the humerus except in this notch an elbow doesn't fit in there it just tends to be just uh, um, an articulation okay um, associated with the femur on the anterior view we're going to find the um, patella or kneecap and the patella sits right about here floating in that articulation that's your articulation surface the patella is actually a sesamoid bone and guys I've seen sesamoid bones form in the elbow and people that do a lot of work with the elbow it's just not as big as a patella but the patella develops in the child as a small bone that eventually grows in response it gives that tendon between the upper and the lower leg and that knee a lot of stress also sort of like the elbow the patella serves like the electron process in preventing hyperextension that means turning that knee backwards and there are people are born without a patella it's very hard for them to stand upright a lot of times what has to happen is if they can't get a fake patella it's easier just to cut off the total lower leg and put it and put a um, prosthetic device so your patella is a sesamoid bone it's not a real bone it's called a reactive bone it has an articular surface the back which fits here and then the anterior surface which looks kind of hideously ugly and I will ask you this in place and also off the skeleton but again no lateral side medial proximal distal on these bones every bone And then as we close this down, we're in your lower leg. And remember the radius and the owner. Look at the association. This is incredible. Know the lateral bone from the medial bone. And guys, remember, this is the equivalent of, this is to be kind of neat now. This is going to be the equivalent of your radius. And this is going to be the equivalent kind of like your owner. These are corollary bones. But the important thing to know is know the tibia know the fibula some people say fibia it's fibula okay that means little bone because it's narrow and skinny know the head the proximal end the distal end that's that forms an attachment to the ankles okay now you have your head region your proximal end distal now this is kind of like backwards from the role of the uh, radius and the ulnar in a way now okay because this because this would be the, the bone that's genetically like the owner but and but functionally it acts like the radius except this holds on most of the ankle what are called the tarsals this helps to form the ankle joint so know this and know what articulates here i'm not going to ask you too many features on this now some people ask you to know this condyle okay from the anterior perspective because because it, it's just an important injury point where tendon and ligament can cause so let us look at the foot from the um, superior view and we can see here the tarsals this is your tarsals the actual ankle bones they're equivalent in number and variety to the wrist bones in fact they're corollaries that means the same genetic tissue so we're going to see that these two right here the talus and the calcaneus are the attachment ones they help attach the foot to the lower leg so right here this little trochlear region here this is what attaches and you're going to have to know it's on a test the talus attaches to the uh, uh, tibia very little to the fibula and we have to know the um because your toes are inward unlike your you know your thumb so this is going to be your medial side your lateral side okay um and and that makes the counting a little kind of different there 
whatever. So, you know, we have your first and your second, okay? Um, and when we, um, what else? Oh, yeah, when we look at these right here, your cuboid and cuneiforms, this just basically means these are shaped like writing, like tablets of writing. These are going to be the main arch support, so the bulk of your arch is supposed to be here on the foot. And why? You want the weight of these to take the bulk of the weight and evenly distribute the weight of that arch here. So not one bone is taking all the weight, but all of these evenly distributed. And this is why if you have a flat arch, these bones are all kind of touching the ground, and that puts a lot of weight on each individual bone. Okay, but and it also stretches this to the point where the synovial sac, these, this gap right here in the joints is being stretched out and you lose integrity. If the arch is too great, it puts more weight on the uh, metatarsals here, which can be a problem. Okay, because that can actually break those bones and again, make it very difficult to walk. So that's your tarsals. There's your metatarsals. Now understand, where's your big toe? Your big toe is medial, your little toe is, is lateral. Now notice on the hands, the anatomical position puts them opposite of the toes, which is really kind of weird because your foot should actually be facing up and twisted around backwards. We're not gonna worry too much about that as far as you know this whole four-legged stance thing. But anyway, so this is gonna be your lateral and medial. Okay, and we count, again, we start with the toe in this case, and count one to five. I'm going to ask. I'm not going to ask you to memorize a metatarsal off the body because that's mean. But but I do want you to know them and know one through five, and then also know the phalanges. And again, the toe is corollary to the thumb and only has two phalanges: the uh, the the proximal and the distal. Whereas the regulars have a distal, medial, and proximal. And on the distal, you see a little pad. That is where we find the tip of the, the toes, the toenail, and also your toe print, which we do have. So on that note, we are done with what you need to know about the appendicular skeleton.